everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of our Clean Water Wednesday webinar series. We're really excited to be able to offer these webinars to our monitors, friends, and clean water community as a chance to learn about clean water issues during this sort of strange time. We are the clean water team of the Isaac Walton League of America, and I'm Rebecca Shore, the Mid-Atlantic Save Our Streams coordinator. You're going to be hearing from each of us during this presentation on ways you can protect clean water while social distancing. I have a few quick housekeeping items to review before I turn things over to our first presenter. First, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Isaac Walton League YouTube channel soon. Keep an eye on our website at IWLA.org for information on recordings and also the upcoming webinars in our series. Second, if you have a question during the presentation, you can type it and send it to us through the GoToWebinar chat box. You won't be able to use your microphones during this webinar to ask questions. We're gonna have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So the webinar should run about an hour and we will be able to stay a few minutes afterwards if folks have any lingering comments or questions afterwards. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Sam Briggs, the Clean Water Program Director to kick things off. All right, hello everyone. Um, so this is Sam Briggs as Rebecca so nicely announced as we were getting going. Um, and so what we wanted to do with this webinar is really give folks some things that they can do uh, in order to really get outside, um, you know, while still social distancing, but doing some good activities for clean water. Um, so some of these might be familiar to folks, but we wanted to get going so that, um, and remind folks of all of our, you know, different activities so that you could pick and choose as what works for you and your families that you're cooped up with, right? Um, first and foremost, though, I just want to make sure that everybody is staying healthy and staying safe during this time. So make sure that Whatever you do, you're you know, washing hands, you're maintaining your distance so that we can stop the spread of this virus and keep everyone healthy. Um, so diving right in, our first option um, is our stream selfie option. So a lot of folks are already familiar with this. It's been around for a couple of years now. Uh, and what you can do is go to streamselfie.org and that'll link you right to the SciStarter project page. And on that page, you can submit a photo of a stream um, that's either on your walk or that's important to you. Uh, so if you go to that link, what you'll do is you'll go to that SciStarter link and it'll ask you to create an account on SciStarter. And all that is is just your uh, email and your name, and then you'll be able to submit your information. Um, so what you would do then um, is go to this page, click get started. You can see some of our clean water team. There's Emily and myself, as well as our former team members, Scott and Heather. Um, go snap a photo of your screen uh, and you will see your photo pop up once you answer some questions about your stream itself. It's gonna ask you questions like, is this on public or private land? Uh, do you currently monitor this stream? How much trash is present? Um, is that does the stream flow all year round? And all of these questions, there's a I don't know option. So don't be you know, intimidated by those questions. It just helps us gather some information about the streams that we're finding. Um, and you can see some examples of stream selfies that we get, that we have gotten over the years. Um, a couple of these, you'll notice that there's some folks that are really close together. So I don't recommend that unless you're a family that's already so, so social distancing together, make sure that you are maintaining maintaining your distance, doing the solo, snapping a selfie. It also does not have to be a selfie. You don't have to be in this photo at all. It can just be your stream. Um, so don't let that deter you as well. And then based on what selfies we get, we're gonna get some really cool information. So this is a great example. Um, this is a map showing where we had trash hotspots. So whenever anybody said there was a lot of trash in their stream, you see a red dot there. Um, and so what that can do is we can take that data, we have access to it, download it, and really manipulate it into cool visuals and maps like this. So not only are we getting information about stream sites that can be monitored in the future once, um, you know, monitors are ready to start going out again, but we can also get some information that you all can use now, like where there's a heavy trash presence 
and where you know you can go with your family and pick up some trash rather than being cooped up inside. Uh, so make sure you head to streamselfie.org and that'll direct you to stream selfies. Um, you need either a smartphone um, and you can submit it all right there when you're at your stream. Or if you don't have a smartphone, you can also use a camera and upload it to a computer and submit it that way. Uh, so either one works. Uh, the smartphone is helpful because it does have location services. So when you're out in your stream, it'll help you locate your spot on the map. Uh, so make sure you go out, take some stream selfies, and we'll be checking those out. We're all um, working from home now, so we'll have some extra time when we're not doing trainings, unfortunately, to help you know digest this information, share what people are finding, and direct you all to where you can pick up some trash or some good monitoring sites for the future. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Rebecca, and she's going to talk about some other options. All right, thank you, Sam. Let me just get my webcam going here. So, all right, very good. So, thank you for that very seamless transition uh, into talking about trash and stream cleanups. So the second suggested activity that we have um for all of you is simple and effective it's a stream cleanup and i know a lot of you already do this uh, probably when you're out monitoring or even if you're just out on a walk or just enjoying time outside trash of course can clog up streams it can block water flow leach nasty chemicals into the water block sunlight it causes a whole host of problems so this is a really easy thing that you can do that's really effective for our streams, especially sites if you monitor them and you want to take care of them, even if you're not able to do a full monitoring biologically. So you can pick you know, your, your monitoring site to go clean up there. You can go to a favorite park or a favorite walk that you go to or explore somewhere totally new. If you're taking the opportunity to explore some new outdoor places, you've never been before, um, bring along a trash bag and this is something you can do that's really quick and effective. Of course, uh, please make sure that you have permission to access an area before you go and pick up trash. Um, some parks might be closed right now, um, others might be open, so just be cognizant if you're going into public land or if you're going onto private land, be sure that you have permission um, to access that site. All you really need, of course, are a pair of sturdy shoes, a trash bag, and gloves or a trash grabber. Definitely, we don't want you picking up trash with your bare hands. And you use the same techniques that we've all been learning for coronavirus. So if you touch anything, be sure not to touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth afterwards. Bring along hand sanitizer. Be sure to wash your hands really thoroughly afterwards. As we all know, if you, you can encounter some pretty um, gross trash in the stream. So we want to be sure that you're being really careful and not getting that um, into your mouth or into your eyes, especially. I know lots of our monitors might have um, heard of stories or know of folks who've had some incidents with uh, trash and various nasty things <laughs> getting into their eyes. The great thing about stream cleanups is that you can also decide how much you want to do. So if you just want to focus on picking up bottles and cans, you can do that. If you'd like to start focusing on some bulk items, that's another thing you can do. So be sure to check and arrange with either your local dump or if, arrange to have bulk trash picked up if you find really big items in your stream. So we've had, you know, of course, tires are pretty common. Uh, you know, in this picture we have chairs, sofa cushions, all kinds of stuff. The great thing too is that you get a lot of exercise when you're out picking up trash and you can even get out on the water. So if you wanna go out canoeing or kayaking, bring along a trash bag and you can actually probably access some of those areas that are harder to get to on foot. So it's definitely a great way to enjoy some new spaces and also do something that's really effective and really good for your streams, taking care of them even during this strange time when we can't do monitoring. When you do go out and if you have some pretty interesting finds or you get some you know really big hauls and you know get other folks involved be sure to take pictures and send them our way we want to be sure that we're engaging with all of you even when we can't do trainings when we can't go out and do our regular monitoring so you can tag us on social media we have facebook and instagram send us pictures via email 
Uh, we really want to hear from you and want to know what you're doing and be able to share that with our community across the country. So this is a nice uh, transition to discussion about, of course, the pollution threats that are affecting our water, which we all know about, but it's nice to sort of discuss and review. So trash is a great example of what's called a point source pollution. So there's lots of threats to our waterways. Um, and point source pollution is the kind of pollution where you can point to it and say, you know, that's a broken pipe that's spilling pollution in, or this is an illegal dump site that's leaching chemicals. However, as we know, most of the threats to our waterways come from non-point source pollution. So these are sources of pollution that you can't point to specifically. You can't say, oh, you know, this entire city is causing pollution. What is it specifically? Hard to pin down. So there's lots of different threats and depending on where you are, it will affect what kind of threats are affecting your waterways. So if you live near a city, if you live near agriculture or forestry, all those things are non-point source sources of pollution. So what do you do if you want to monitor and try and pin down maybe what are some points, what are some specific sources of pollution in your streams? So we actually have some simple, simple chemical tests that you can do um, to hopefully be able to narrow down what are some threats that might be affecting your waterways and start answering some questions about how healthy your water is. So our first program that we're gonna talk about is our Salt Watch program. And I'm gonna hand things over to Emily Bialowis, who's the Chesapeake Monitoring Outre Outreach Coordinator and our Salt Watch guru. Hello, one second. <laughs> okay. So, um, for winter salt watch, um, all you need is a smartphone or a camera um, that you can upload to a computer, um, a small cup, for putting your chloride test strip in and the chloride test strips, which we send in our salt watch kits. Um, you can see at the bottom here what our winter salt watch kits look like. This has been a really successful program that we've done. This is our third season now of winter salt watch. And I believe quite a few of you have been participants. Um, salt watch, salt watch started, um, because of what you're seeing here, which is a pile of road salt on the road outside of our office. Some of that salt is sitting right on top of the storm drain. And one of our interns noticed, hey, um, that's going right down to the storm drain into our muddy branch, um, which is our local stream. And maybe that is impacting the chloride levels in our streams. Um, so, we started this program where we send kits out to folks and um, they share their chloride readings with just the picture of their chloride test strip on that conversion chart and they share it on Water Reporter. Um, so those are some, these are some submissions. One of the reasons that chloride is an issue in the water is because um, it can impact wildlife. Um, if you are familiar with the monitoring programs at, uh, with Save Our Streams, you know that we monitor for benthic macroinvertebrates. We're looking for them to determine stream health and chloride in fresh water can really impact those benthic macroinvertebrates. It can impact fish um, and it can impact mammals as well as it can impact human health as well. Um, it can get into drinking water and um, affect people's health. We're worried about things like reducing salt in our diet. So if there's salt in the drinking water, that is also an issue. Um, people share both their chloride test strips um, on Water Reporter. They also share piles of salt. And if you see a pile of salt, you can um, clean it up like our former clean water fellow Scott did here. 
He's got the tiny shovel and tiny bucket. He cleaned up a pile of salt in our parking lot. Um, at this time, if you already have a salt watch kit, great. Um, you can use it out. Now's the perfect time to do it, actually. We are seeing a lot of rain here, here at least this week. Um, so that final runoff into streams, it might be a good time to look at chloride levels. Um, salt watch is also really easy to do by yourself and um, or with your family. And um, like Rebecca was saying, you just want to be careful about touching anything before and after and washing your hands well. Um, and we are still fulfilling requests for salt watch kits, but um, it might take a little longer than usual. And there might be a point where we don't have kits to send out. So you can order these chloride bottles that you see here directly from Hawk. Um, it might be a little hard from Amazon right now, but we can share information about how to order that bottle. And then if all you have is a bottle, you can just take the picture like the one on the right here. You just take a picture of the strip with that chart on your bottle. And then we get a lot of great results. Um, this is still from a few weeks back, but we've seen results from all over the country um, with a lot of new participation out in the Midwest, um, in Minnesota and Michigan. And as always, we have a lot of great participation here in the DC area. Um, I know if you're from the same, if you're from the DC area like we are, you know that there was almost no snow this year, very little salt put down. But you can see there are still some hot spots, um, which shows why it's important to get out and do the salt watch monitoring. You may be thinking, hey, it's the spring going into the summer. I thought this was called winter salt watch. Um, we do salt watch in the winter time because that's when you see the salt on the road and you see when it can be going into the waterways. But chloride actually can have its most dangerous effects on um, aquatic life in the summer months when, those temp when the temperature is higher and the benthic macroinvertebrates can be a lot more sensitive to the chloride in the water when the temperature is higher. So salt watch is still really important in the summertime. We just have focused in the past in the winter because when you see it is when you worry about it. But if we're gonna be stuck doing things at a social distance for several months into the future, um, salt watch is still a really valuable program to participate in in the summer months. And if you wanna, work with us to um, monitor SaltWatch without us sending you a kit, you can, we can be in contact with you. Um, next, to talk about more chemical monitoring and more, more different chemical parameters you can monitor at this time, we have Zach Moss, who is our Iowa Save Our Streams coordinator, and he is going to take over and tell you about that. Hello. Mm. All right, folks. Um, thank you for joining. Um, like uh, Emily mentioned, my name is Zach Moss. Uh, I'm our Midwest SOS coordinator here. Uh, I am based out of Iowa, working uh, a lot in Iowa, um, but also do a little bit in some of the neighboring states, um, working with SOS and water quality stuff. Um, so again, thanks for joining. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some other chemical monitoring options that you have. Um, it's really kind of appropriate timing because uh, we were already trying to uh, encourage people to do some more chemical testing this year um, and then this COVID-19 situation um, is kind of pushed us even further in that direction now because uh, chemical testing is a great option if you're not able to go out with a big group. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, know that we typically 
train and, and talk about uh, macroinvertebrate sampling, which usually requires a little bit larger group, and you have a lot of people huddled over the top of a net together, um, sorting through bugs. Um, whereas chemical monitoring can be done alone if you'd like to do that, uh, or you can just go with uh, other people that are in your house, or if you do go with a group, you can do it from uh, you know an appropriate distance apart from each other. One person writing down results and one person um, getting the results with the tests themselves. So um, right now it's a great option if you're uh, trying to maintain your social distance. Um, and all you'll need to do chemical monitoring, like it says here, is you just need the test kits themselves. Um, all the all the tests are done in the field um, and they're relatively affordable. And then you also just need a, a computer to submit results on our database, which is uh, the Clean Water Hub. And I'll talk about that a little bit more after this part. So, like I mentioned, um, this is relatively cost effective. It's easy. Um, if you've been to one of our trainings, you'll know that, like I mentioned, we typically spend a lot of uh, time focusing on macroinvertebrate monitoring. Um, we also do cover the chemical monitoring in our trainings. Um, but if you have not been to a training and uh, you don't really have any idea what I'm talking about right now, that's okay. These tests are all available um, on Amazon um, or Chemetric and Hawk are the, the actual suppliers. You can go directly through them as well. And when you order these kits, they have the um, instructions printed directly on the bottle or on the kit themselves. Um, so if you've never done this before, it tells you step by step exactly how to do it. Um, so that's why that's why we say here that you don't really need any training necessarily to, to uh, do these. And then it's also uh, cost effective. If you're uh, only interested in doing one or two tests, you can you can get some kits for you know 20 to 40 bucks. Uh, you can do one test or you can do our full full range of tests depending on your abilities um, financially and uh, time wise. And then there have been studies that have shown. Uh, that although these are field tests, they're not as specific. Um, you know, they kind of have a, a little bit wider range in the results that you might get, um, rather than giving exact results down to really far decimal po decimal points. Um, but although they're not as specific, they have been found to be really accurate. So um, you won't be able to pinpoint an exact decimal point value all the time, but uh, um, it'll line up closely to what you would get in the lab. If you're familiar with the Isaac Waltney, you might know about the Clean Water Challenge. I'm guessing most of you might have an idea what I'm talking about, um, but we have a goal to monitor 100,000 stream sites by our 100th anniversary, which is 2022. Um, and so this is just a, a really easy way to help us get a little bit closer to that goal. Not everybody is gonna be able to be trained in macroinvertebrate monitoring um, or be able to um, get down and, and get in the water and do these tests uh, or do the, the macroinvertebrate monitoring. So this is a lot more accessible way for people to monitor for water quality and get some more sites uh, and more watersheds tested. Mm. Sorry about that. All right, so for some reason we're having some technical difficulties there, but uh, what that uh, what that slide was gonna gonna show is just some kids next to a creek, and um, the reason that that slide was on there is because this is a really fun and accessible um, option for kids, uh, whether you're with uh, Boy Scouts or you just have kids trapped in the house if you're stuck at home and they're not not able to go to school. Um, you know, it gives you almost instant results in some cases. Um, within 15 or 30 seconds or uh, a few minutes. And so that's really, um, really nice for kids who maybe don't have a long, as long of an attention span. Um, you can just pull, pull a strip right out of the water and you can see as the color changes what's, what's in that stream. So that's kind of a nice uh, instant gratification for kids. Um, and it's really simple. Um, it's hard to mess up. Um, and so it just, I did it, I did it personally in high school um, and had a great time with it. And so I think that uh, 
if you have young kids, it'd be a fun activity to go out and test if you've got a park nearby or a stream going through your backyard or something. Um, and additionally, like some merit badges and different uh, different programs and activities through scouts and other, other groups like that uh, could use this chemical testing. And if you're if you're wanting to do our full range of tests, um, it'll take less than 15 minutes. <clears throat> it's relatively simple. You can see here um, we have some people looking at turbidity. Um, if you're not familiar, that's just uh, how cloudy or how clear the water is um, to kind of measure the different particles that are suspended in the water. Um, if you are uh, part of an Isaac Walton League chapter or really any any property, including your your home, um, it can easily just be integrated into the maintenance activities. Uh, just once a month go out and it takes less than 15 minutes when you're mowing or, or doing whatever else you're doing. Um, just do your chemical test and uh, put that data up on the hub. So uh, if you're familiar with our macro invertebrate monitoring, we, we typically tell you to aim for streams that are knee deep or below uh, or knee deep or shallower. But uh, these uh, these chemical tests can be done almost anywhere. Um, you can do it on a large stream or a small stream um, or a river. And then like you see here on the slide, if you're not able to scramble down the banks, I know here in Iowa, um, we deal with flashy streams a lot. Um, so we have a lot of steep cut banks. Um, and so what you can do here is what this, what this person's done in the picture. And they've just got a little simple bucket um, with some rope or twine and a little spool. It can be, you can use a little metal bucket. Um, I've seen Cut off, uh, cut off the tops of milk jugs and use that. Um, really just any kind of container. And then you just can lower it down, dip it into the water and pull it back up um, and take your test straight out of that, that container. One thing to keep in mind though is um, that you, don't, you never know what's gonna be on the inside of your, your container that you're using, um, whether that's water left over from the last stream that you just sampled or um, from whatever used to be inside the container. So, uh, we recommend uh, typical quality control recommendation is to rinse the bucket three different times. <clears throat> so maybe go, if you're testing on the upstream side of the bridge, go on the downstream side and pick it up, fill your bucket, uh, dump it out, do that three times, and then go on the opposite upstream side of the bridge so that you're not uh, sampling the water that you just muddied up. And that's a nice option if... Uh, you know, if you're a little bit older and, and don't necessarily want to scramble down and get in the water or uh, if the water is running really high after a rain, um, just to make it really nice and easily accessible to, to different groups of people. So here we've got uh, our typical spread of chemical tests. Just from left to right, you have uh, pH up on the top, dissolved oxygen, um, a turbidity tube on the top right. And then on the bottom, phosphate, chloride, a thermometer, and nitrate and nitrate. And we have a lot of great resources. If you go to www.iwla.org slash SOS, um, there's a lot of great resources on there on what these tests mean, um, some of the different uh, water quality issues within your watershed that could be affecting those, um, those parameters. So just an easy one is uh, nitrate that could be uh, a result of fertilizer runoff, whether that's from a farm field or a golf course or just a residential area. Um, and then um, dissolved oxygen is obviously an indicator of oxygen in the water, um, which can be affected by algae growth within the water, um, how cloudy it is, the temperature of the water. And so really you can learn a lot about your watershed by doing these different tests. And so it's really, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's instant gratification sort of um, when you pull out a test and you see the results, you can tie that to what's going on in your watershed and, and kind of track that over time if you monitor once a month or, or monitor consistently and you can track how that changes and try to figure out what's going on and what's affecting your water quality locally. And so if all those tests on that on that previous slide are, uh, might, might seem a little intimidating or seem too much or too expensive, then you can easily just start with nitrate and uh, temperature. So you can get a nitrate bottle for less than $20, and I think that has 25 tests in it. You can get a thermometer for less than $10 out on Amazon or, or all sorts of different suppliers carry thermometers. And so um, you can do one, you can do two, three, um, or if you'd like to do them all, that's great too. 
And that link there on the on the screen there is what I mentioned is iwla.org slash SOS. We've got uh, all the different chemical tests and where you can order them. We don't sell them directly um, right now. We just can point you to the other suppliers that do do um, provide them. And uh, if you're interested in just doing nitrate and temperature, that's an easy indicator of uh, what's running into your water. Um, and if it's warmer or colder, that can affect algae blooms, can affect aquatic life. Um, and so those are just some really valuable temp or really valuable readings that you can gather. There we go. So um, I mentioned the Clean Water Hub earlier, uh, just briefly. And so if you go to www.cleanwaterhub.org, um, you'll see you can come to a page sort of like you're seeing here on the screen. Um, we've got data points all across the country, a big cluster of historic data in Iowa and um, good Virginia SOS data over here. But we've also got a bunch of data points all across the country. So <clears throat> you can go to the cleanwaterhub.org. You can create an account. It's really simple. Um, just use an email address and some basic information um, and then just create an account and then you can choose your site and input your data directly on there whether that's just nitrate or just temperature or if you're doing all of it um, anybody can can get on there and publish their data and we have a lot of great resources on that um, that link at the bottom of this page as well as if you do go to the clean water hub there's a, a help tab in the top right which has a lot of great options to help you out so if you were to uh, click on one of these purple dots or to click on your own site if you create one it'll lead you to something like this and so you can see here this is a nitrate reading at a site um, starting you know all the way back in 2017 and going up through 2020 and you can track whether it's green for good or if it's going up into the yellow orange and red range it's really easy to to interpret what these results mean um, so you can look at that if you've never, if you don't have a science background or you're trying to share it with somebody who doesn't have a science background, you can easily look and see just based on color um, what you're finding and, and what that means. Um, we also have helpful links within the site to learn more about what might be causing your, your readings, um, whether that's high nitrate in this case or um, pH, we have a little bit of information on what that parameters actually mean. So I'm going to pass it off now to um, discuss about the Creek Critters app um, that we're partnering with the Ottawa's Natural, Ottoman Naturalist Society on. Um, and I believe uh, Sam's gonna talk about this. All right, let's see. Um, my screen should be sharing right now. Yep, we can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so, okay. Um, so now here's another option that we are actually really excited about. Um, as Zach mentioned, it's called Creek Critters. And for this one, this is gonna help folks get in the streams to find macroinvertebrates, um, either if they can't go out in a group or if they've never been trained before, this is a great intro for folks to get started with that. Um, so for Creek Critters, all you need is a smartphone, um, an aquarium net, but if you don't have an aquarium net or and you have SOS nets, those will work. Um, or even a butterfly net should work if you're in a rocky stream as well. Um, and then a pan or bowl to sift through bugs and a spoon to help you pick through bugs as well. Um, you can use other tools as needed, but that's really the base um, that you'll need to get started. Um, oops. So here you can see that it'll help you walk through and identify bugs. Um, and then on to the next one here. Um, so you can see from the uh, screens here, we're, this is in partnership with Audubon Naturalist Society, and they actually created this app on their own a few years ago. Um, Audubon Natural Society is an environmental organization in the DC metro region, um, and I actually had an internship there way back in the day, which is where I got started with macroinvertebrates in general, but also with the Creek Critters app. Um, and now we're lucky enough to work in partnership with them in order to uh, promote this Creek Critters app nationwide. Um, so you'll see here, you'll, you can download the app for any uh, Apple or Android phone. 
Um, you'll create an account, which is very easy to do, just you know, like any account that you'll already use. Um, and from there, you can collect critters. It's going to teach you how to um, find the critters from your stream, those macroinvertebrates that we love so much at the Isaac Walton League. And so it'll actually walk you through, you can see in this middle screenshot here, it'll walk you through step by step in how to actually collect those macroinvertebrates, which is really great for folks who have not done one of our Save Our Streams trainings. Um, and then from there, it'll help you identify the macroinvertebrates you found and give you a stream health score. So just like what we do with SOS, just really simplified in an app form, um, it'll score your stream in excellent, good, fair, or poor based on the macroinvertebrates you're finding. So this is a great thing to do solo in a very shallow stream or with you know, your family that you are already cooped up with. It's a great time to get outside and see your stream health score over time, especially as the weather gets nice and you're ready to get in the water and get out of your home. Um, one thing to note about this app is that we are also working with the folks at Audubon Natural Society. They're gonna be putting out a new version of the app soon and it's also gonna connect to the Clean Water Hub. So any information that you put into that app is gonna automatically port over to the hub and you'll be able to see your stream sites on the hub there as well. So it's gonna be really valuable data. It's gonna help us get folks out there monitoring. Um, so make sure you go ahead and download that app. It's just called Creek Critters um, in the App Store or Google Play and you can get going with that today. Um, you can also just play around with it now if you're not ready to go outside and wanna see how it works. Um, you can play around with that Make sure that you check that you're just playing around with the app so we know that your data is not from a stream um, and see how that app works and get ready to go outside and do that type of monitoring as well. Um, and with that, I think we are going to open it up um, for questions. So I'll turn it back over to Rebecca. Thank you, Sam. So we do have a few questions that came in and if you continue to think of questions while we're talking, feel free to keep submitting those. So um, I'm just going to scroll up through here. And uh, we did get a great reminder from uh, one of our monitors, David, that if you're going out and you're close to the water as well, something else you can, you know, if you wanna be sure to wash your hands or you're wearing gloves, another thing to consider is eye protection if you're gonna be around trash, if you're gonna be around any of this stuff. So that's another thing that a really you know easy thing that you can do to help protect yourself is if you have safety glasses or I also just wear regular glasses as well um, that's a good safety safety tip to keep in mind so we did have a question about um, stream selfie from Caroline which is that if you're submitting a picture um, online so you took a picture in your camera and not your smartphone is there a way that you can put in your location um, to make sure that it's in the right spot um, yes. Fiona, yeah. um, so this is Sam uh, for stream selfie. If you were just using a camera and going back to a computer, there is a map function when you submit that selfie. So you can just scroll over the map similar to how you would do it with uh, like Google Maps and just click on the point where you took that picture. Um, so okay. it's going to make sure you remember where you took your pictures so you can locate them on the map. But you can do that after the fact. Great, super. Uh, we had a few questions about SaltWatch. Um, so this is actually just a general question, but we do get asked this a lot about salt, uh, which is why isn't salt being filtered out of our drinking water or is it filtered in some cases? It is, it is not filtered out of our drinking water. If you know, um, you know, we don't drink salt water as, as humans. Um, and any place where they do have drinking water that's coming from salt water, they need basically a special desalination plant to do so. So it's not so simple to just filter out salt. It takes a lot of, you know, special equipment and technique and cost that we don't really have the infrastructure for to do for fresh water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's something that I think people are often surprised to hear, but uh, yeah, it's definitely becoming more of a, I think the public is becoming more and more aware of this issue, which is good. Uh, we had another question about Saltwatch, Emily, which is what would be a good reading for chloride? Can you talk about the range of the different readings? Sure. 
So we use the EPA toxicity limit, um, which is 230 parts per million for as a chronic exposure to chloride. So um, we sometimes see readings much higher than that, like up in the six to 800 range. And that's when we're really concerned when we see regular readings um, around 200, that's also not good. But, um, you know, a regular fresh water shouldn't have much salt in it anyway. Um, it should be definitely below 100 um, and probably closer to the 15 to 30 range, which um, is below the range of our chloride test strips, but we just say it's below 30 and we feel pretty good about that. Um, so we don't, we're not alarmed when we see things around 100, but um, we still don't think it's great. Yeah, for sure. Um, that would you just re restate the names of our two kit suppliers that we like to use for um, our various chemical kits? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's Hawk, which is H-A-C-H, -H, and Chemetrics, which is C-H-E-M-E-T-R-I-C-S. Um, and I believe if you go to the <laughs> WLA.org slash SOS, um, the, the equipment links should send you to them. Um, but yeah, again, it's just chem or er, metrics and Hawk. They also, um, and I think you put out. Oh, God. Sorry. Um, this is they, also in exactly at spelling Hawk, <laughs> which was H A C H. <laughs> um, I also encourage folks to shop around. Um, the suppliers tend to have the cheapest uh prices but sometimes we'll see uh sales at like other suppliers like forestry suppliers will sometimes they're a distributor that will sometimes have these test kits um so oftentimes i will google them the test kits themselves to see if i can find them in other places as well um so so hunt around when you're looking mm -hmm. yeah i think right now especially we do often use um, Amazon, of course, but bear in mind that Amazon right now um, is prioritizing certain kinds of shipments over others. So it probably is easiest to go direct through a supplier uh, um, rather than go through Amazon right now. Uh, we did also have another suggestion and reminder from one of our monitors, Valerie, which is that go to multiple sites. So if you decide you know, you want to spend a few hours out monitoring and you want to visit a few places. Um, do be sure between the different sites that you clean off your shoes or your boots um, between. Uh, this is good practice, not just for, you know, the reality we're in right now, but this is really good to prevent the spread of invasive species or other kinds of materials between stream sites. So it should be actually nice and seamless to incorporate all of our different and for keeping our communities healthy. All right, so we have a few more um, questions. One of them is a little nitty gritty. Um, Sam, maybe you can speak to, do if folks need to be concerned about um, permitting for if they're going out and monitoring, if they're monitoring in a park or a public area, um, sort of any suggestion practices if you're going out and you wanna say sample salt or nitrate, yeah, um, typically for chemical monitoring, you do not need a permit to do so. Um, one of the things to be aware, as always, when you're monitoring is whether you're on public and or private property. Um, typically on private prop or public property, you can just go up and you know take your water sample, do your tests, and leave. Um, for if you're doing creek critter sampling, or if you are going to be there for an extended period of time and you're in a park or whatnot, um, as folks have mentioned, as I think Rebecca, you mentioned about trash cleanup, you may need to get special permissions from the park staff to do that. Um, so just make sure you're contacting the right folks. And if the park is closed, you know, abide by those, those rules right now. 
Um, otherwise, for chemical monitoring, bridge access, just make sure you're parking in a safe spot um, and that you are, you know, out of the way and in a safe safe area, you know, away from cars to do your sampling as well. Um, so for the most part with these things, don't necessarily worry about permitting unless you need special park permission to, to hop in the streams at this time. Great. And um, this is sort of a general best practice for chem monitoring. How long after, and I guess it depends on what kind of chemistry you're doing, how long after a precipitation event should someone wait before they do a stream quality test? And I guess this might be different for chloride versus some of our other metrics. So yeah, Emily, if people are sampling for salt, what do you, how soon after, you know, rain or snow should they wait? And then uh, Zach afterwards, maybe if you have um, some thoughts about for other types of chemicals. So for salt watch, you can go right after a rain event or um, if it, if it's snowing right before, right before it snows or um, right after it's snowed and maybe salt has been put down. Um, we say that just because we're trying to give people a better idea that the spikes of chloride you might see are coming from that runoff. Um, so that's why we're doing that sort of spot monitoring, but um, for more regular monitoring, we might have different recommendations. Zach? Yep. Um, typically, if you were to attend one of our uh, SOS trainings, um, our recommendation is to try to wait a couple of days after a big rain event, um, because our goal is not necessarily to uh, to purposely seek out bad results, um, but to try to get results that are indicative of the the typical water quality in that stream. Um, but you know, if if you're just getting these kits and and you happen to go out, like the only day you're able to go out is after a rain event. Um, you know, you haven't been to a training, so there, there's a little bit different expectations that it's not going to be quite as uh, quality assured, um, but still be a valuable activity to do. So my recommendation would be to, to try to wait a couple of days if you're able to, um, although you can definitely find some interesting results if you do go um, the day after or right, right after it rains or something like that. Um, and you can kind of see what's getting washed into the stream. But uh, if you wait a couple of days, it'll kind of settle back out and you can get results that are more indicative of what's actually going on in the stream. Awesome. This is a great question. Um, is it better to monitor a larger stream compared to a smaller local stream? Um, Sam, any comments on that? Um, so as far as, that is a great question. As far as, um, access make sure that you can safely access the stream that you are monitoring or access the water that you're monitoring um as far as is it better for smaller versus larger i mean they're all connected um so you know the smaller streams tend to flow to larger you know streams lakes rivers and so on um so if you are seeing results in a small stream you'll know that those those high levels will flow then to a larger stream um one thing I have done with a group in the past, which is pretty interesting, is we we started in the small tributaries and then monitored a spot there and then followed them in as the streams and rivers got larger. So if you wanted to make a day of it and really see how those, you know, that all flows together, you could start in the small streams and then see if the results change as you get into the larger streams and rivers as you go down. Um, so not better or worse, just make sure you're putting your spot in the hub in the right spot, um, marking your location correctly so that we know where you are. Um, and then also you'll notice when you submit data, it's gonna ask you some more questions um, as far as like the weather. Um, so that will also help us get a sense of, you know, the if you went out right after a rainstorm, we'll know that based on your responses to the weather questions. I'd also add on um, that sorry, keeping, go ahead, Zach. I'm sorry, the chemical tests that we do, um, they measure concentration. 
And so if you are in a larger water body, such as a, a large river, um, you might not have a huge change in the concentration because there's more water. Um, but there's also, if the concentration is the same as a smaller stream in a large river, um, that means that you have a lot more um, volume of pollutants going through that, that water body. So if you're finding five milligrams per liter in a small stream, um, that's not going to actually be that much of that pollutant, let's say nitrate, for example, but you're finding five milligrams per liter in a much larger river that that feeds into. Um, it's still the same concentration, but there's a lot more of that chemical uh, it's just being diluted through all the different, all the water in that body. I was also going to add that depending on where you are, larger waterways might be more regularly monitored or have some sort of um, monitoring station set up by a state or county agency to regularly monitor there and smaller streams don't necessarily have that. We did have a few folks ask about um, other kinds of monitoring. Someone mentioned E. coli monitoring. So the monitoring that we you know, we talked about today is basically what we cover. There are other organizations that monitor for, they might monitor for heavy metals, some other, um, of course, chemical and bacterial concerns, but that's not something that we do or we in that. Um, you can definitely email us and we can point you to some of the org other organizations that we know of um, and partner with for that kind of information. But for right now, um, those aren't parameters that uh, that we use currently. All right, well, I think that's just about all of our questions that we have for now. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we really do encourage you to engage with us on social media. Um, a few of you mentioned some fun um, social media campaigns that you've seen involving collecting trash and plastics, things like that. So we absolutely love hearing from you and seeing what you're getting up to during this time. Um, you know, it inspires us, especially because we're not able to go out and train and meet all of you in person, which is what we really love to do. Um, Sam, if you could just go to the next slide. So we are presenting, this is a weekly, oh man, it's not on there. Uh, we're presenting this as a weekly uh, webinar series. So um, we do have a webinar lined up for next week. Um, this is going to be presented by our conservation director at the league, Jared Mott, and it's about the Clean Water Act. So in the early months of 2020, hard to believe, um, earlier than now, uh, there was actually a regulation change made to the Clean Water Act, and it will really affect, have a lot of effects on water quality throughout the United States. So this will be a great presentation sort of outlining what the Clean Water Act is and what these changes mean for um, our country and for clean water in the future. So thank you again for joining all of us. And thank you, of course, to the clean water team uh, for putting this together so quickly. Feel free to email us with any questions or um, reach out to us with any comments. And we hope to see you next week or at future webinars. All right, thanks everyone.